Hello and welcome again. And uh, this is this is uh, my trip from uh, Guadalajara uh, to Mexico City. So basically, going um, started from the west coast and heading across to the uh, to the uh, east coast of uh, of Mexico. I wasn't going to quite get me through Mexico City, but um, this was one of those days where you, you just get on the road and you're, you're basically, it's a route of 60. It takes you through some interesting towns along the way and um, be a, lot of, uh, a lot of these sort of, you can see these stops along the way. The really, um, once you get onto the main highways, you're going to be doing a lot of this, um, a lot of these uh, uh, stops. Mexico is one of those countries where the motorbikes also pay the tolls. Um, a lot of the Central American countries and and quite a few of the South American countries you don't need to. The, the more advanced the country, which Mexico is, the more likely you're going to have to fork out the dollars. And it becomes a pain in the backside. Like this day, I took a photo, I think I did 13 stops along the way um, with uh, our toll, toll booths and it's a little bit annoying, you know. I just, I, I really don't know why, um, why they, why they do this. Uh, it seems to be, it, it would. So obviously, I do know a good reason why. But what it basically means, with the cost of it, you're probably, you're probably spending about twenty dollars for the day, um, twenty US dollars for the day riding. But it basically excludes most of the population from being able to afford to travel on those roads. So they all go on to the on, on the other roads, which is basically town to town to town. This ride is a this ride took me about eight hours and thirty minutes, but if you went direct it was about five hundred and forty kilometers, so you could probably do it in about five and a half hours. Um, just I mean you can do it a lot less than that if you want to really fly, but you know, I, I always took the took the approach so I just wanted to take the time. But it was quite interesting. There was a lot of beautiful little small towns, and they, usually there's about a half a kilometre, you know, a kilometre, half a mile off, off the off the highway. And I stopped in quite a few of them along the way, just had a look around. It was, you know, it's pretty pretty sweet. So yeah, so basically, um, uh, t today was Mexico City. I was going to get my motorcycle uh, serviced. It had been now. I've probably done around about uh, about six, six or seven thousand kilometres, I think, so far, um, and there was nothing really wrong with the bike. But I, I knew there was only a, a few certain points where I was going to get a good service place to get my bike serviced, um, and you know, you you really got to. You've really got to time it. I mean, this is a, a relatively new bike. It's KTM 1290 um, Super Adventure, um, but it still needs servicing. Um, and the, the real difference is, is that uh, as you go further south, the fuel quality goes up and down, and there's a little bit all over the place. And you know, the ethanol, uh, the, the ethanol levels can vary, and they don't really tell you uh, what they are. And so the bike does need a good service and. Um, and Mexico City, the place, the KTM Mexico City were fantastic. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the guys there. Really took an interest in the bike, and it. And you'll find that in most places, sometimes you'll have a little bit of problem um, with them. Uh, but I, I got my bike serviced in Mexico City, then Cartagena, uh, which was really bad. At what they, they were, you know, they just didn't know what they were doing. And even though they were, they were all KTM approved service places. Um, but kind of, uh, next time I would I would do Mexico City, I would do Panama, I would do um, if I skipped Panama, I would def I would do um, in Medellin, which is a really nice shop, and they look like they really know what they're doing there. Uh, Medellin, and then and then Santiago, Chile, and then possibly if you were going to continue on for Buenos Aires, uh, Buenos Aires was a pretty pretty good but they all still made little tiny mistakes that that they shouldn't do they shouldn't make you know if they do a thorough check over it um, not all of them did it but uh, the KTM guys in Mexico City were fantastic um, so today was pretty much all about just get, get, getting the miles on the road and, um, and getting to Mexico City I was going to spend around about five days there you know two or three days I'd have my bike 
and uh, spend some time um, having a look around the city and going to the Tehekoan, whatever, however you pronounce it, ruins and a few of the other ruins around the city. Mexico is just, it's just one of those places where I'm, you know, as soon as I, as soon as I knew that I was only a few days away from leaving, I knew that I was really going to miss it. Um, it's such a beautiful place and the people are just, they, you know, all the stories you hear before you go there, and I'm sure there's some bad areas and, and I feel for the people that have to live, it, live through that, but all the people I met were always just fantastic and always interested in what I was doing, where I was going, you know, what, what type of bike I had, what's the, the, the size of the engine, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff. And, but not only that, also telling me, you know, like when I had some paper maps in my tank bag and they'd say, oh no, you should take this road, it's really good, you know. So when you meet some adventure riders, the only adventure riders, and I've said this in previous videos, I was really shocked at how few that I saw through um, Baja, Mexico, um, uh, Central America. I started seeing more as I got into uh, you know, towards the, the bottom of Central America and Panama. Um, and you know, obviously, we all caught the, the there's a bunch of us caught a ship, so I met quite a few there. But on the journey, I was really surprised at how few that were actually out there. You know? um, it was quite a rare occurrence to see somebody else. If you did see them, they were usually from that country, just travelling around the country. I think a lot of people just skip Central America, which is a bad move because uh, it's such a beautiful place, so such great riding. You know? um, yeah, so um, Mexico City, um, I mean, it's sort of pretty overwhelming when you get to it because it is absolutely gi gi ginormous, like it is. A, and it sort of really hits you because there's people that live on the in the slums on the sides of mountains and there's just how look like um, building after building, a house after house after house, very small ones, all just, just chock-a-blocks crammed into these mountainsides. And, I think some of them were built on a, an old rubbish dump. Um, yeah, but I actually rode through them. One of the days I rode through some of the slums and um, the roads were pretty bad and all that sort of stuff. But again, kids playing in the street. And these are the most dangerous areas and, and stuff like that. But I saw lots of kids playing in the street. And, yeah, it's pretty nice. And the street food, you know, when I lived, you know, I live here in Miami and I'm from, in Australia and. Um, I've never been. I've never thought about tacos. You know, people say, oh, "Let's go get some tacos." Oh, whatever. Um, but the tacos in Mexico, God, it was just so, so nice. And and because all the small towns, the street food, how they make most of their money is from locals. The food is always really fresh and really good. Uh, and you get a lot of it. Like you'll get, you know, a couple of tacos, but then you get all these tomatoes and onions and all these fresh vegetables with them, and it's just. It's nice. And the sauces they create, I mean, they have to be really good to make money because they don't charge a lot. Uh, they don't charge a lot of money for the, for this type of food. Um, but they, um, you know, they, they just do such a fantastic job and, you know, it's, it's quite nice. It's usually a family affair too, the mother and father and a couple of kids working in there and uh, it's pretty cool. So there's a couple of cities that I went through that actually had some pretty bad things happen in the past. Um, you know, with the drug, drugs and all that sort of stuff, but they were still beautiful cities. And, and you notice with all these towns, they're quite a religious country, um, like Roman Catholic, and uh, you know, a long, deep history of that, you know, going back a few hundred years. And so some of the churches are just phenomenal, you know. And some of the places are very, I mean, they, they, this, this, these are on the, on the freeway, but they're very, um, they remind you so much of some of the westerns you, that, you, that you watched as a kid or, and still today, uh, just the beautiful churches and white buildings and all that sort of stuff. And it's pretty cool. Um, but you know, I think that if, if you're going to be, if you're going to be uh, getting, just want to talk about bike servicing. If you've got an old bike, well then you you want to carry a lot more parts with you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stories out there that I heard on the road of just people just breaking down a lot. And, you know. Once you get onto the dirt roads and you start getting into um, you know, Patagonia and places like that, you're going to need like spare oil filters, fuel filters, air filters, um, cable tires, or anyone, even myself, and all that need. I carried with me um, some fuel filters. Um, I carried with me 
um, just some basic things. You know, I, I had all the tools I needed to take off, my, take my bike apart. Um, and probably a little bit too much because the tools do weigh a fair bit. So you've really got to try and get tools, like one tool that can do a lot of different things on your bike. Um, WD-40 always have a can of that handy. Um, but a, a new bike, the main problems you're going to probably have is something to do with your fuel filter, um, uh, your fuel pump, fuel, uh, your fuel because of the quality of the fuel, um, and your tyres, maybe punctured tyres and things like that. So you want to make sure you've got the tools to be able to change a tyre, which is a pain in the backside. It takes quite a while, but once you've done it a few times, you sort of get, get the hang of it. I never had to do it on my trip. So once I had to, but I had a you know, heap of people just stopped and helped me immediately, so it wasn't so bad. But if you if you break down and you get a puncture in a remote area, you want to have a puncture repair kit. I've got tubeless tyres, so you want to have a tubeless tyre repair kit. Um, uh, you can get slime. Um, some people just uh, swear by it and have it with them all the time. Um, I only had it with with me. And I had a can of it. Uh, tube of it with me for Patagonia, didn't need it, um, but uh, a lot of people really swear by that slime stuff. Um, that'll get you, you know, if you, unless it's something really severe, that'll get you part of the way, but you still want to have a, uh, a tube, tubeless or tube uh, tie repair kit, puncture repair kit, because you can, um, you know, feel a, a lot worse a um, uh, puncture with, with, with one of those. And the best way to do it is to you know, it's one thing about Miami that I've been disappointed with our KTM dealer here is they don't have like service nights where you can actually take your bike in and the mechanics pay, they pay good money, but you, they take you through a process over, you know, might do like a four or five week course of one, one time a week. You go in with your bike and you, you know, five or six people and uh, the guy takes you through all these different processes that you might need to do on the road and understanding your motorbike. I wish I'd done a course like that. Uh, even though I didn't need it, I think in the future I'm going to need it. And so it's either probably pay somebody. And unfortunately, I live in an apartment in Miami Beach. I'd love to have a house with a garage because then I could just tinker myself and take things apart, put them back together again. But unfortunately, I don't have that space. Um, yeah, so along the way, you're going to pass you know, through here. You'll pass through uh, different towns. And I stopped off. On, on most of the smaller towns that you go through, I, I, I'd stop off. But the bigger ones, I just breeze through. My camera is the Drift Ghost uh, S. There's a new version that seems to be coming out for a long time now, the 4K model. They're a small company, so I imagine they're going to have uh, problems with that uh, uh, when they first bring it out, so I won't buy that. I'm just more interested in the frame rates at 180p and, uh, and stuff like that. So, you know, if we can get it up to 120 uh, frames per second, whatever that version is, is that, that's the one I'd be using. Um, not that interesting in 4K for the, for the bike stuff. Make, making the microphone better. Uh, it seems that the only microphone that works well with the Ghost is the actual one that comes from the, fa uh, from the factory. Uh, none of the other ones seem to work properly. And I bought some decent ones and they just wouldn't work. They just crackled and you know, nothing you could do about it, which was very annoying. Um, so if they work on that and then work on the interface and maybe a testing thing as well. One thing I'd really like them to be able to do is because you've got, you know, I use Euclid Digital and there's Cena and all these other ones and how they haven't developed something that allows you to record as well as take phone calls because you can take phone calls and talk into them. How they can't work with your phone to do and have in their side their app to actually uh, audio record as well, record your voice uh, is pretty pretty late really because it's not, it wouldn't be that big a stress for them to do that. They've developed such good technology for actually talking and being able to be understood, that it's quite surprising they haven't uh, done something about it. Because then you wouldn't need the extra kit, you know, and you could just you know, grab the audio and put it on top of the video wherever you wanted to. Um, and probably because it's inside your helmet, you're not getting as much of that noise as well. But the, 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 the microphone that covers with the Drift S, I went through three of them. So I probably, if I had have used that the whole way, which I didn't, I probably would have gone through four or five of them. They just started to deteriorate for some reason, maybe the weather, a bit of dust in them or whatever. 
um, and so I just had to put them aside and, and use a new one each time and then they seemed to work well for about a month um, before deteriorating again. Um, so yeah, um, a, a good idea is to um, it is to is to work out your kit beforehand and use use that kit over and over again before you go on a trip uh, with your recording and all that. The, it's going to be nearly impossible to um, to do video editing on the road. Like I found that just with the internet connections that I was getting, it was just going to be impossible, and I never got into that routine. And one thing I, w I will do on my next trip is actually record more um, footage of me off the bike and just talking about my day's ride each day. I think that's a better way to go about it. Uh, Vlogs, uh, uh, video logs and stuff like that, I think probably a better way to go about it than doing it the way I'm doing it now, which is uh, in post, we come back home and, and collecting each video and, and, then, uh, and then uploading. Uploading it it's, because it does take some time. It's probably about two or two to three hours work, even in this raw format, uh, to do it this way. Um, and it would be a lot more um, if I did it properly. You know, had you know, had transitions and all that sort of stuff. But for these ones, uh, this is this is how I'm doing them. And then I'm going to do some nicer ones for because I did. I've got a whole bunch of tools that I used, and I'm going to select all the ones that uh, that were big fails, and also, also the ones that were really successful with all the kit, from the sleeping bags to the to all my tools, to the uh, cameras that I've used. Helmets, all the gear, I'm gonna go through each and do a, do a, you know, a, 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 little, a little brief um, video for Instagram, like a one minute video for Instagram and then a longer version uh, for YouTube and, um, and some of the others. Um, the, the knowledge you gain on the road is, is invaluable. I mean, you, you're never going to, you know, if somebody said to me, oh, you know, I've only just started riding a motorbike and I'm going to go on a long trip, is, well, if you're a sensible person, you'll do it easy. You know, if, if you're a person who just wants speed and, and you're going to get yourself in trouble um, because you, there, there's so many things that happen that you just can't foresee happening. And dog, uh, animals coming onto the road, like I got bitten by, on my leg a few times by dogs and they just come out of nowhere and they scare the shit out of you because you're just sitting there cruising along and then all of a sudden, bang, out of the side of the road. And, um, there's a little trick with dealing with, with dogs, depending on how many there are and how wild you think they are, but I found that just by completely stopping, if, if, if you're, especially there's places, if you're on a, on a tarmac road and you're a free rear clear run, you just accelerate the hell out of it and they can't catch you. But if you're on a slippery dirt road in the middle of a town, which is more than likely where you're going to encounter them, is the best thing is to just stop and they're thinking, hey, hang on, this is not the deal. They just stand there staring at you. They're just on their four legs just looking at you going, what are you doing? You, your job is to ride slowly and my job is to try and bite your leg. Um, I got bitten in uh, La Paz and, and a few places. Uh, you know, I, I've got my uh, climb gear on and the only, uh, only one of them punctured through that and got, got cut my leg open. Um, and that was in, uh, in uni uh, in Bolivia on the salt flats there. And that was a nightmare because the road was so bad getting to the hotel, going through this little village. And it, you know, like it was a pothole every 20, 20 centimetres. So you just couldn't accelerate fast. You're just going to come off the bike and everything was rattling and it was hard as a rock. It was salt crystals, like a dirt and salt all mixed into one and it was just all hard and hard packed stuff. And it was just a nightmare going in and out of that place every day and I got bit pretty bad. Um, if I had a gun, I would have shot that freaking thing. Someone's dog, it just, there was like 10 or 15 of them, you know. And if you're on a rough road and you, you got a dog biting it, usually you can just kick out just try to kick them in the face or whatever, but when it's real, it was so rough, I had to concentrate on the road and then try to feel where the dog was, and I went out to kick and missed him, and as I brought my leg back in, he just latched onto it and had it, had it for about two, two or three metres. It was enough to punch it through my leg and cut me open in two, two spots. Um, yeah, but I mean, I even encountered them just on a highway climbing up a mountain. There was like four or five dogs from no villages anywhere. They just you know, they're just wild dogs and they just all had a crack at me but they didn't get me because I was on a, on a road so I could just accelerate past it. Um, so the, the thing to do is to concentrate ahead of you and if you feel 
you can kick out and do that while you're concentrating, do that, but don't look at the dogs. Just try to feel where they are and, and do the damage from there. Because looking at the dogs is not going to be a smart move for you because you want to look where you're going. But they are a freaking pain on the backside. But Mexico City, when I got there, they had the, this was around October, uh, end of October and they had the Day of the Dead. And it was pretty, uh, it was a pretty interesting uh, time though. It's a beautiful street art. It's actually quite a beautiful city. Um, the roads, uh, and this is this is coming into the city, but the roads, pretty, um, pretty, they're, they're pretty good. But the problem is that Google Maps just doesn't know. In some cities, just doesn't know which ones are one-way streets. So you think, oh, well, okay, it's telling you to go this way, and then you go that way, and then all of a sudden you've got to go all the way around again. And there's a lot of traffic once you get into the city, um, which is not not ideal, um, but. Uh, uh, great street art, beautiful, uh, lots of parks and gardens in the city, so we, which is pretty cool. I spent a lot of time walking around, just had my bike in service for two or three days, uh, but I really love the place. Uh, it was a really cool place, and they've got up on the mountainsides, they've got the favelas, the, 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 the slums, sorry. Um, and uh, and then through the inner city, there's some really nice, you know, quite leafy, well to do suburbs, you know. Um, but you know, it was a pretty cool, cool city. It's a huge city. You just won't believe how big it is until you actually get in there. Um, a lot of people. I think it's the second most populous. It's the highest, the second highest capital city in the world too. It is. It's thirteen thousand feet up above sea level. So you do get a little bit tired walking around and stuff like that. A little bit more than what you normally would. But once you're acclimatised to it, you're, you're fine. Uh, it's not so bad. But I really, I really loved uh, the city and. It's sort of like, as I was saying earlier, you, you get into a, um, this, is where, this is where you get into trouble. See these roads here where actually you can't actually get off that lane. Um, yes, and you're basically committed to going up one way and I ended up going up one, the wrong way. And then I had to circle all the way back, it cost me about 30 minutes. It wasn't here, but it was a bit further down. Um, but um, you, you'll find that, um, Um, yeah, but uh, you, the, the thing about the, you know, with walking around and stuff like that, I, um, I, yeah, after a couple of days, I got acclimatised and and, uh, and I was fine, you know. Uh, but you do get you get out of breath if you're going up steps and, and things like that. You'll find that you'll you'll get a little bit out of breath um, to the first few days. Um, a smart move to do is if you. If you're going to um, do some sightseeing, get a few Ubers. If you meet a really good Uber driver, because it's so cheap, uh, you could hire an Uber driver for a day and um, and get them to um, get them to uh, show uh, to show you around. So you, to hire an Uber driver for a day, for a half day, maybe it might cost you like 40 40 50 dollars, a generous fifty dollars, you know, um, and it's well worth it. If you get someone who can speak English and say and start telling you about the city and you know, oh, this person looks pretty cool, just ask them. Off the books, off the Uber books, and just ask them if you can take them for, for some sightseeing. Most of the time, they're going to say yeah because they they won't make as much money as that, and they get to just have one ride for the day. And usually, they'll just say yeah, well, I'll take that money, and then I'll take the rest of the day off. You know, so, but be generous about it. You know, I don't like it if someone's going to do something for you and do. It, and do a good job for you. You want to, you want to reward them, you know. I watch other uh, riders, and they always talk about how everything's so cheap, and you only have to, you know. One guy was complaining about paying an extra, you know, one dollar and stuff like that. I'm thinking, God, guys, you know, you're in another country. You, the, the the little people that you meet all the way along the way, just a few dollars extra can make a huge difference to them, you know. So. Uh, just be generous with it. For the, any of the big franchises and stuff like that, of course, you have at it. But uh, for the for the, the little people, I, I always think like the street food people, like it might be $2 for a taco, so I'll give them five, you know. Um, yeah, because they're always really nice and it's not much of a, a, a thing for me and I'm not going to miss the, those 2 or $3, so just, just, just be generous. But anyway, this, uh, that's uh, Mexico City and uh, I'm going to show you a few photos now from, uh, from my time in the city. So this is just getting into uh, 
Mexico City and trying to find the, the place that I was going to be staying. It was an Airbnb. The guy sort of ripped me off a little bit. Um, that was one of the stops along the way, just getting some food. And uh, I met these guys, these two guys, two Mexican guys, uh, and they were just riding around just Mexico and having a bit of fun. They were really cool guys, really nice guys. This guy, the taller guy, spoke a little bit of English. There's some of the uh, green art in Mexico City. That's pretty cool. And there's a lot of really, really nice parks in and around the um, the city and some pretty cool sculptures and, and all that sort of stuff. Not that I'm, I'm that big on that sort of stuff, but um, yeah. And this was in one of the main parks that they had a they had a castle which you go up to the top and I didn't bother going up there because they they wanted to have your backpack and all that sort of stuff and I had my passport. They they just stored them in the outdoor type lockers um, and I just wasn't willing to park. That was in the castle up there. I just wasn't willing to park with my uh, with my uh, passport. I just won't do that at any time. I mean even you'll even go into some shops um, in the shopping centre and they'll ask you for your for your backpack and just zero chance I'll just go to another shopping center I'm not gonna leave my backpack in a friggin on a shelf you know with my basically life in it you know? um, this is the street art that I was telling you about this went on for this was like a kilometer of this type of stuff this is the day of the dead um, uh, celebration it just kept going and going and going and it was quite phenomenal it was like a little bit scary but a little bit not so scary you know? um, there's some great architecture in, in and around uh, Mexico City as well. Um, it's a really cool place, and uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, you know, I knew that I had a few more days of riding in Mexico. And I was sort of was going to be sad to leave it. You know, I knew I was excited about the new, the new adventures that I was going to be going into, and this was going up and getting outside the city into some of the slum areas. But, um, again, this is the, one of the central parks there. Had Wi-Fi in there. Wasn't that flash though? This was just a short walk from where my apartment was. Nice little park. This, these guys here were making these uh, tacos and stuff. They're some of the, the, the poor areas uh, on the mountain. Looks like the, uh, I went on a tour and, uh, as well. I hired a Uber driver. And I can't remember the name of this restaurant, but that food, that soup was just phenomenal. Some crazy mural art inside it too. These are the guys from the KTM service, as you can see behind it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty modern sort of facility and they really knew what they were doing. And, yeah, it was a pretty cool place. This is just riding on my way there and um, on my way to Mexico City. Um, that was early in the morning as I was leaving Guadalajara. Spectacular um, sunrises. Lots of big mountains and stuff in the distance. I didn't actually ride this day. There wasn't much riding through any of the mountain ranges. Hugged a few lakes, a few big lakes with mountains on the other side of it, uh, which was pretty cool and quite beautiful. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was one of those things where I was really, really sort of started to feel a little bit sad about having to leave Mexico. Um, just so many really sweet people. Um, People that, people, you know, they just come up to you and they always interested in your bike. I, I never got bored of it. Some other people I've listened to have said, oh, you know, you've got to go through that whole process with them again. But, you know, these people were always friendly and always willing to lend a hand and always wanted to get a picture with you on the bike and for their Instagram or whatever and you know, always excited. So, you know, I felt it, you know, so I thought, no, I don't care. It didn't worry me. But anyway, guys, that's, uh, that's uh, quick Guadalajara to Mexico City. Uh, a, a good day's ride, mainly on the highways, so a little bit boring on the roads, but I had a great day. All right, any questions or comments below, as usual?